this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Culture Hub. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, you're a part of a unique uh, group of people. You're the first uh, people to come in person to Culture Hub since the pandemic started in New York. So we're really happy that you're here and it's very meaningful to see people back in this space. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, La Mama Experimental Theater Club and the Seoul Institute of the Arts, um, which are our two founding partners. And without them, uh, the uh, programming at Culture Hub wouldn't be possible. And I also want to thank the New York City Artist Corps grants, uh, which are um, revitalizing uh, live performance around the city and, and, and really uh, helping us come back, um, even in these still strange times. Um, it's been a great experience uh, over the past few days getting to put this show together with the Waves of Gravity team and um, uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, we are, uh, you'll get to meet uh, everyone, all the creative team at the end of the show. We're going to have a short Q&A uh, and you, we would love it if you stayed and asked any questions that you might have. Uh, we're also live streaming out to um, audiences online to sort of expand the reach. So folks out online, uh, if you want to participate in that Q&A, uh, you can do so from the Culture Hub watch page. Uh, there's a chat function built in, and uh, if you want to throw out any questions, uh, even during the show, feel free. Um, if everyone can silence your cell phones, if you haven't already, um, those of you at home can leave them on, but um, uh, in case of an emergency, we have uh, two fire exits. We actually have a um, fire exit to the back here, and we also have the stairs, which you uh, probably came up on the way in. And uh, as everyone uh, is in the whole building is vaccinated, so thank you for being vaccinated, And um, but we're still gonna ask you to uh, remain masked uh, Know, covering your nose and mouth through the duration of the performance and while you're here we really appreciate it so um, without further ado I give you Neil Moore guy astronomer with a telescope 
searching for the Big Bang. A continental drifter, hyphenated, hybridized, fused at the molecular level. Exploring stellar regions. Groping time and space. try to hold the experience during this moment, or this one, or maybe you can grab this one. Well, you can try. We are all in a process, process of becoming. becoming. Do you remember being a kid? I do. Anybody? It's all a blur to me. Time had a different pace back then. For most people, their childhood was isolated memories. The moment you live in as a child is a much bigger percentage of all the moments you have lived. All your life, you've just been a kid. You don't have an experience of that larger time cycle. Now, 
I have this concept about the gravity of the moment. That's right, you can increase the weight of the moment and you can make time slow down. Just like in Einstein's theory of general relativity. You know that one? I do. Anybody? Well, basically, the faster you're moving, the slower time goes. And the more gravity there is, the slower Slow, time goes. This is true. My poetic take on Einstein's theory is that if something serious is happening, or you consciously increase the gravity, the weight of the moment through your focus, sound and attention, you can actually slow down your experience of time. And those gravity moments in life stick out. Fun, sad, serious. You know what I'm talking about. When you're a kid and you're having fun, time can go so quickly. Right? But then if you have that heavy moment happen as a kid, that's heavy, man. It can be really slow. It can feel much slower than even now when I'm trying to slow Slow down down time time, time, consciously. consciously. Warping time and space. I vaguely remember lying awake at night in our house in Westboro, maybe being bored. I couldn't sleep. I remember lying in bed and time moving really slowly. And there was this girl named Beldam. I didn't like her or anything. It was just her name, Beldam. And her name just kept going through my head. Beldam. 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 It was just kept going through my head and I was so bored. Beldam. 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 I had these waves of boredom coming up. Beldam. Beldam. And it just took so long. That time was just, can I just go to sleep? Beldam. 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 Waves of boredom. What if we could create waves of gravity? gravity. Like when two black holes collide, literally when two black holes collide, an actual wave of gravity is formed that changes the fabric of space and time. Another night there was a moment where I remember lying in bed, maybe playing with my Star Wars figures, It was a similar state of melancholy, and I was thinking about death somehow. It was, it was vague. And my dad came into my room. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just thinking. He said, you're too young for that. Go have fun. Stop Stop thinking. thinking. I didn't know then what would happen just a few months later. I was 12 years old. I got a call from the hospital. It was late at night. My dad was still out playing tennis. Now my mother worked at a hospital. So I was surprised that they were asking for her. They should have known that she was in India at that moment. They asked for a neighbor who might be looking out for my brother and I. Moments later, I watched as he pulled into our driveway, walked up to the front door, And that moment took forever. And he told me that my father had passed from a heart attack. Now I have these isolated images from him. Some random memories, certain ones stick out more than others. Oh, and I have his LP LP collection, collection. the only media known to last. And I have some of his mannerisms. My family in India tell me that, you know, I, I move like him. I even eat like him, move my hands like him. So sometimes I wonder, you know, did he ever move like this? 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 Like
this. Maybe I should stop thinking.
Thank you. All right. So, you know, I wouldn't say that sitar was my calling at first, but music had become my calling. It was calling me away from life as an engineering student. <laughs> That's right. I was studying civil engineering because it seemed like the most civil thing to do at the time. I was in classes, uh, calculus, chemistry, physics, electricity and magnetism. That EMAG didn't do too well. I had to do the REMAG. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't have to do 3MAG. Um, any other failed engineers here? No, no, okay, all right. I was using my left brain in class and then my right brain outside of class, playing guitar, writing my own music, and working at the radio station where I hosted a show called Continental Drift and I learned about music from all over the world. It wasn't until later that I learned to refuse those parts of my brain when I started about the science and mathematics of sound and music. After I graduated from Georgia Tech, I went to India and I started studying sitar. That's right. You have to start with the basics. You start with sitting. That's right. So you have to sit on the ground to play. Not in a chair, you sit on the ground. In fact, that's why they call it sitar. No, that's not, that's not true. <laughs> but is sitting is such an important part. You have to learn this discipline of just sitting and doing that one thing for a while. And I haven't been all that disciplined. So that was hard for me. <laughs> strings of the sitar can take a while to tune, but when they sing back at you with these waves of harmonious overtone rich sound, it's so rewarding. mentally and physically to do this one thing again and again and you imbibe the raga science years later I was finishing my MFA thesis and I was thinking about concepts of the physics and metaphysics of music questions about sound and time can we have sound without time can time exist outside of sound? My head is swimming in all these concepts. And it was the day before my MFA portfolio was due. But then... Hi, this is Cindy. Can I speak with Neil? Cindy Lauper? 
I'm playing with Wyclef on David Letterman tomorrow. We want a sitar player, and I heard you might be the guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely. You I gotta would play love to some hip hop beats. Have you ever done that before? We need someone who has done that before. Oh, yeah, yeah. I used to jam with all these bands. Okay, so are you union? You gotta be union for this gig. I'm not union, but I'll join the union. No oh, problem. Hold on, no. hold on. Let me talk to my manager. Hold on. I'll join it. It's okay. Uh, you know, okay, I'll you don't have to be union. Oh. Okay, all right. I'm so excited to play with you. You want to tell me about the music? Or uh, you uh, know? See you tomorrow. Okay, oh, all right, that's cool. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. All right, that sounds great. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this is good. Our next guest is a, uh, a Grammy award-winning musician whose new EP is entitled uh, From the Hut uh, to the Projects to the Mansion. Can we, you want a chair? Can we get you a chair? I'm sorry. I did, didn't occur to me. I, you need a chair? You all right? Okay. Yeah, no, he's fine. <laughs> Where are my men? No, he meant to be there. I, I don't That's know. where he's yeah. supposed to be. Okay. That's right. I was meant to be there. That is where I was supposed to be. That's for sure. But the best part, you know, the best part was when we, in the commercial break, we plugged in our instruments, and Paul Schaefer and the band were jamming on this Bob Marley song that you all know, and Paul gave me this look through his sunglasses. He was like, yeah, man. He broke down the band. And I just started playing along. Wow, we got it reversed. Here we go. the show is this instant recognition it seemed like everyone had, who I'd ever met contacted me with congratulations it's a little overwhelming almost all my family friends they saw me on TV they were like oh yeah Neil's made it he's on Letterman so now music is suddenly maybe a good career choice maybe even success Meanwhile, I asked Wycliffe where the after party was. And he said, yeah, man, I'll call you. I'll call you. All right, Wycliffe, cool, cool, yeah. Ah, it was so fun. That day flew by. It seemed like it was 15 minutes of fame right there and four minutes of song. I was the only sitar player ever to play on the David Letterman show. It's true. I asked Paul Schaefer. Thank you, folks. Beautiful. Great job. The, uh, the sitar. Is that what it is? Wycliffe, good to see you, my friend. That's right. Mr. Sitar, he knew it. He knew it. That's good. He was telling everybody else, too. It was good. It was good. All right, how's everybody doing? Yes. All right. 
That's really good to hear, because this show is not just about me, but it's about you and me. Your focused energy and attention create and shape the space. That's right. In fact, has anybody ever heard of entrainment? Entrainment, yeah? What's entrainment? That's right, that's basically right. Entrainment is a physical phenomenon applied to all waveforms. Like-minded waveforms, they like to sync up. They like to come together. If they're, if they're kind of close, then the energy will bring them together to one, to one thing. That's entrainment. Um, have you ever seen people walking in NYC and their arms and legs just start moving naturally together in unison, right? Or let's see, or you're in great conversation with somebody and the ideas are flowing and you're on the same wavelength, man. <laughs> or, um, oh yeah, did you know that the earth and moon are entrained such that we only see one face of the moon as it travels around the earth every 28 days? That's entertainment, I mean entrainment. <laughs> it's the process of like waveforms sinking together. Now this drum is called Da. It's a great tool for entraining minds. <laughs> it's from Iran, from Persia. A Sufi drum. In fact, I wanted to go to Iran once. I was in India, traveling around. I had a letter from Jalal Zulfanun, this very senior maestro of Persian music, who had accompanied in dozens of concerts. So then I went to the Iranian embassy to try to get a visa. I showed him my letter. This won't work. You need a letter from your own embassy. Okay, all right, so I go to the U.S. Embassy and I show them the Jalal letter. And I say, you know, I just really want, I, at first I had to wait around. This guy didn't, took a long time to show up. I was waiting there forever. I showed him the Jalal letter. I said, I just want to go to Iran and study. The Iranians tell me that I need a letter from you guys in order to go to Iran. What can we do? We don't issue any such letters, especially not for the Iranians. Oh man, that's, that's harsh. Okay, so I go back to the Iranian embassy. This time I brought my da. I was sure I could get this visa. So they, I give them the letter again. I explain how I just want to go to Iran, study the music, and imbibe the culture. It just wasn't working. So in a flash of genius, I pulled out my da and started playing. <laughs> Our internal si time signatures are beginning to link up, to sync up. Our hearts are beginning to find the beat with other hearts in the room. Our breathing is becoming the same. There is no 
sound without time measure, and no time measure without sound. There is no sound without time measure, and no time measure without sound. The waveforms of you, me, and the embassy guy are starting to become entrained. Together, we are becoming a new entity. Harmony is the goal of the universe. This is the Embassy of Iran, not a concert hall. Please leave now. Ah, oh, man. I didn't want to go to Iran anyway. <laughs> what I really wanted to do right now is tell you about this, this special vocal style that you may have heard me doing. <laughs> singing is overtone singing. This is true. We are all singing a myriad of notes all the time. We just don't know it. We're not aware of it. We can't always hear these different dimensions of our own voices or in the voices of others. We need, we need to listen with judicious attention to the mathematically aligned infinite musical harmonics, the universe of overtones inside all waveforms, all sounds, like right here, right now. The magic of the sitar sound is in the juari. That's the bridge that gives life to the sound. That buzz you hear are the overtones infinite in number, the life of the party. And now with the voice, just gonna hum. That's the best way to dampen the overtones. Mm. And now the overtones revealed. Mm. There's no effects here. Well, I'll cut the reverb, okay? It's just me, the microphone, and all of you. Oh, this is my handy dandy overtone warp tunnel right here. That's right. These concentric rings that you see represent different pitches, different frequencies. So you can actually see in living color the universe of sounds. If you do this, if you sing, well, first let me tell you that our voices contain all these other dimensions. We just have to learn to pull back the curtain a little bit, right? Now, you don't have to ask how you do this, Neil. You have to ask, why do you do this, Neil? <laughs> That's because why very slowly is ooh, oh, ah, a, e, and sweeps up through the overtones. You can see in my overtone warp tunnel. And the reverse is eow. And I'll tell you a little secret. That last little bit is aum, the prior primordial sound. You can get four distinct overtones. Um, it's so therapeutic to make the Y sound. If you do this 20 times in a row with deep breaths in, in between, I guarantee you'll feel transformed. 
So remember that when you go home and practice in the bathroom. <laughs> no, really, I used to walk around New York City looking for the most reverby, echoey spaces I could find. Stairwells, the subway. The, the train would come by and the brakes would be screeching. I would be singing at the top of my lungs, but nobody could hear me. With the, uh, anybody else, anybody else do that? Oh, all right, yes, okay, all right, all right. We're like-minded people here. <laughs> I've worked with these sounds for 20 years, and I've found a lot of comfort and support in discovering these tones within the tones, the overtones. Living in that sound, the pure sound, is a healing experience. Long year, no, my long year. 
Thank you. I made a song about the creation of the universe. The universe. It's a kid's song. I've written a lot of them over the years, but this one is my first time. I wanted to make it simple about the sound. That's the one. And how that sound created the universe and the galaxy and the stars and planets and all of us. Because we're all made from the same stardust. stardust. This is the concept of... You know it. The Big Bang, the sound that created the universe. How do you tell that story to a child? First there was the sound. Now I'm teaching it to my two-year-old daughter, Leela. She's so inspired by all things space. She has to see the moon every night. She knows the names of the planets in order. Order, order. She wants to know about the galaxies. I think I did something right there. But I was actually a much younger man in a different space and time. And I did not realize it then. Perhaps, perhaps I wrote this story for my first daughter, Rihanna. Shortly after she was born, Rihanna passed. After only a few days of being on this planet, this was almost 20 years ago. Rihanna was here for such a short time, but she had such a huge impact on my life. How can those few days of space and time feel so much longer than the days themselves? How can one person's life have so many ripples and waves throughout my much longer life? Losing a loved one is one of the heaviest moments you can go through. And yet time just keeps marching on. I learned lots about music and played hundreds of gigs, learned how to cook like a champ, had long rafting trips through the Grand Canyon. I even got my MFA in interdisciplinary arts and learned how to mix it all up. Then I have to get real. We're talking about the black holes here. My partner, Jessica, who had such a zest for life and was so connected to earth and nature. Jessica, she too passed. It's hard to hear and even harder to say. Sing. But she was in a lot of pain, and she, she took, took her, her own, own life. life. It was 10 years later that I only just started the process of trying to pull back, see the larger picture, like an astronomer through a telescope, searching for the big cycles of time when the small things you can see without a telescope don't make sense. Oh, 
But since then, I have been making my own path forward and choosing to move on in time. Through healing and sound and music and community with Brooklyn Raga Massive. Anybody know it? Yeah. Oh yeah. I thought so. We literally started our weekly jam session the month after Jessica passed. It's been an ongoing music therapy, a place to experiment with new ideas, be with friends, and also create space for other performers and lovers of raga music. Today, we've been trying to slow down time. Feel the gravity of each moment. But time is going to catch up with us, just like making improvisational music. We don't know how it will end until it's over. First there was the... First there was the... First there was the sound. First there was the sound. First there was the sound. Oh. First there was the sound. First there was the sound. Oh. The universe was made from that sound. With billions of galaxies spiraling around. The universe was made from that sound With billions and billions and billions of galaxies Spiraling around Spiraling around Now, the galaxy are made of stars All the galaxies are made of stars In the night sky you can see them from See them from afar In the night sky You can see them from See them from afar Star, the sun set around the sun. 
star, the sun. He's the solar system, all the planets spinning, all the planets spinning, all the planets spinning, in eternal, in eternal rhythm. I was born. First there was the sound. I'm in a new space and time. And teaching this song to my daughter, Leela, makes me so happy. First there was the sound. 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 Everybody sing. First there was the sound. Om. Om Shanti. All right. Thank you. You guys still with me? Everybody still with me? time for the last song. I know. We want this time to last forever. But, you know, time moves on. 
And it's time for the last song. I'm going to do a little tuning, a little setting up here. <laughs> Big thanks, first of all, to my wife, Seema Lisa Pandya, who created this artwork behind me and a lot of videos and animations. A round of applause from Nicole Biancasino, our great director and my longtime friend and family. And big up to Culture Hub, Billy, Deandra, John, the whole team. They did some great work during the pandemic, keeping the music going. Thanks to New York City Artist Corps for funding this whole thing today. All right, let's do it. I used to hear from people that my music was very sad. Well, it, it made them sad. Maybe I was sad inside. I'm not sure, but it made them sad. So I wanted to sing an upbeat song. A song about hope. hope. But I've been scared of hope. We're hoping too hard. Sometimes having any hope at all. I started to worry during the better times of lightness and joy that, oh no, there's another black hole just waiting around the corner. So I've been afraid of hope. But I hope for hope. Hope is a thing worth hoping for. But right now, today, I am here with you. And I wonder, is getting together in a room full of people again during COVID a form of hope? Vaccinated, of course. Is storytelling a form of hope? Is making music a form of hope? Is hope another word for healing? Whoa. 
warping space and time Black holes collide In waves of gravity Warping space and time Can we slow it down for the good times? Can we speed it up for the bad times? This might take a long, long time. The entrainment of vibrations, sinking hearts and minds, sending waves of gravity, warping space and time. I'm going to do a quick Q&A, or a brief Q&A in a moment, so you can stretch if you need to, people on the ground.
Okay, anybody here have a question or comment or anything for Neil or Sima or me? This is Neil Murgai. He didn't introduce himself, so Neil Murgai. And um, Sima Lisa Pandya, who did um, art and um, video. And then my name is Michael Bianks, you know, I'm the director. So, anybody? Great, thank you. So it was, what was it like to work as husband and wife is a question. With the baby. With the baby, With the baby yes, yes. Well, thankfully, thankfully, grandma is here right now. So <laughs> this whole week, we were, could just work together. And it's great. We've been working together uh, on and off over the years. And uh, she's been part of helping me develop this, this whole thing um, as I... <clears throat> been working with my looping and expanded that to include video, video looping as well as audio looping and, and producing this kind of psychedelic live stream uh, with sounds and visuals and then we use some of Seema's artwork. And then I thought, uh, well, I, I'm already doing the, the, you know, the making the music and mixing the audio and the video. I'm just not doing enough here. So then we added the theatrical element. Yeah, I would say that um, you know the we you know we we both are artists in our own right, and um, I found that the videos actually came as being inspired by Neil's work, so they they have evolved together. And um, but I'd say working on this show in particular, you know, it was nice to have McCool as like kind of our pivot point. So it's like, oh, I want. I'm I'm not gonna nag him. I'm just gonna tell the director to tell him that. You know, so, so that helped working together. Yeah, and there was a lot of you know these intimate stories that uh, you know McCall and, and and I you know, you know, we mined my MFA and you know just my my mind <laughs> and, and picked out stories from my life. But actually, that was the kind of that was part of the process that I couldn't work with Sima too much on. It was like just too. Too close, too personal, those harder stories. But I've known McCole for 25 years or so, so, you know, we're, she's very familiar. <laughs> oh, this doesn't work, but I'm pretty, okay. Process or any? Occupy. Check. Um, I was just saying, have you tried or attempted using your music intentionally for uh, therapeutic purposes, like maybe with communities when you were in India or even if you were here? But yeah, yeah, definitely. I participated in in kind of, I mean, concerts are healing too. But then there's there's a certain more intentional kind of sound healing space that I've definitely been active in, and um, not in India yet like to do that um, and also during the pandemic and over zoom a little bit too do you, doing this whole like you know the visual part uh, over zoom with kids in, in school kids and adults in schools has also been very empowering but I uh, definitely want to do do more of that and it's part of ceremonies too and definitely been, yeah thank you anybody else yes Platform, you mean? Yeah, the question was about the, the, the stage, the platform, if it was for acoustic reasons. I think it sounds better to be higher for sure, but also the presentation, you know, presentation. It was a little higher than I would have liked, but these are these great, great things that could happen. I think it does change the sound for sure, but, you know, there's so many speakers around too that, uh, you know, it's better to be raised for sure, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I'm happy to take any questions. Also, I don't know if we're monitoring the, the, uh, the chat, but if anybody online also has any questions. No? Yes, we're using Ableton Live to, to loop the audio and uh, in conjunction with VDMX, which is a VJ software to do the video. So um, there were times when I was controlling the video and, and other times where you know, they were controlling Sima's videos uh, from the back. And when I was controlling it, yeah, I have like MIDI keys set to start looping in Ableton and in VDMX at the same time. And then I can run all these effects on the videos and, and audio, of course, too. And then uh, you know, mix and match the video and audio through both of those softwares together. I haven't, I haven't seen too many people actually try to do video looping and audio looping at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. This mic might not be working. Is it working? Try it again. Here, use this. So, uh, my question is, um, in your process of creation, how much of what you're creating is like, I have an idea and I'm gonna figure out how to make it with these tools, and how much of it is I have these tools, like what can I do with them? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, this has all been like a, a pandemic project, and um, at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I'd already had this kind of looping practice that I'd used different, you know, starting with the boss pedal and then expanding to this app called Loopy on an iPad. And then at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, okay, let's go to Ableton and do, do the real thing. And because I knew it was just so much more sophisticated. But then at that time, I had the, the vision also for the video uh, and uh, to, to do that in conjunction. And I was just like exploring so many different softwares to see how to do it. So I, I definitely had the vision first to, to try to do that. But then along the way, it's like, oh, I, what can I do now? What can I do now? Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for McCall, which is just how it was to, you know, to work with somebody that, you know, you, you've had a long friendship with and to be able to extract um, <laughs> This story, which I think um, is, uh, I think you did a beautiful job at, at really bringing that story together and, and um, you know, not telling Neil's full journey, but, but certainly like pulling out these moments that, that came together in such a beautiful way. And I, I'm just curious w what that process was like. Um, well, we agreed that, well, I read Neil's <laughs> MFA thesis, <laughs> more than 200 pages, but uh, so I read a, you know, I read a thesis, um, his thesis, which was about, as he speaks about in the show, like how, you know, different, you know, connecting like sound and actually space and time. And so it's like some of it I didn't understand, but actually in his thesis, he also writes very personally and like had made a lot of connections between things that have happened in his life. Um, and and these high concept ideas, and I think that's pretty cool. And um, and so sort of, at first everything was on the table, but then it's also like this is a person, this is Neil's life, you know? So I'm not trying to put something on stage that Neil doesn't want. So really, you know, Neil sort of led the process in terms of like, you know, we, I said, these are really interesting to me, these stories um, that are in the thesis. And then Neil and I have had conversations, and I was like, I remember having this conversation with you that was interesting. Can we put some of that in there? You know, um, so um, so some of that was like base, basically conversations with Neil, but also I think like every step of the way I was like, don't put something out there that you don't want to put out there. Just, you know, there's no like pushing to, to put something out there and whatever you want to put out is because it's part of your story and you're at a place where you are able to put those stories out there. Is that true? Do you feel that way? <laughs> Yeah, I will just add that, you know, when I approached McColl, you know, I was developing this whole sound 
visual experience. And I was like, wow, I, can't, I need to put a story to that. And I've really been wanting to work with Nicole for a long time. So, so I called her up. And then it was her, I, I was like, I don't know what the story is. I just know there's some story that, that can be told here. And it was her suggestion, well, it should be your story and not, not some other story. So that's, I didn't like intend to tell my story when we started this a couple months ago, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. <laughs> and it's been great to work with her. And of course, Sima makes all these beautiful uh, pieces of art with tabla heads and uh, has animated some of those things into the, the videos that you saw here. So it's a family affair. <laughs> yes. So um, my favorite part of the show was uh, when you were making like sounds and um, the video behind you was like interacting and it was closing in on you or, or expanding based on the why, you know? But then it's like, what can you like talk about what that was? Like, like what were we seeing and why was it reacting that way? Yeah. And then Seema, like what was the, since you were creating these shapes and, and, and the visuals, what, how did the sound and, and what that was inform what you're making? And does that backdrop also have anything to do with, with that? Sure. Yeah, um, well, first about the backdrop. Um, so I have a whole series of artwork that's based off of uh, used tabla heads. And for me, it's about um, you know the embodiment of rhythm and rhythm and uh, repetition and, and sound and sound waves being this force of the universe, as, as Neil put so eloquently over the last hour. But um, this form uh, I use in a lot of my artwork and, and a lot of the visuals that you saw um, also on, on the screen are kind of based off of these mushroom shapes that are based off of two sine waves kind of facing each other. So, you know, one sine wave and another sine wave. Uh, so it almost creates almost like self-referential feedbacks, if, if one could say that. And so I would say, you know, the I had a lot of the visuals that you saw were based off of stills of the artwork, um, uh, sculptures and drawings and things that I have. Um, but then, you know, it wasn't enough to, I think, say, oh, this is really cool. I just want to put it up. You know, it's going to be cool. You know, it, like this, the, the visuals, at least my intention in making them was to be an aid in the storytelling that Neil was, was doing. So, you know, um, you know uh, I think certain choices like uh, in the piece that you're talking about where he's doing a lot of the overtone singing, you know, the, the round piece actually really matches the, the overtone warp tunnel, which is kind of uh, incidental, but, uh, but, um, but it worked really well. But it's also like, you know, kind of that really slow moving visual that's not going to interfere with the music, but is something that's there to aid in the feeling and not like to overtake the music. And I think that's, that was the kind of like the choice in a, in a lot of them. And, um, Maybe just one one more quick thing is that, uh, um, you know, in the idea of feedback, you know, you saw a lot of visual feedback, uh, you know, of Neil and and things like that. You know, f um, feedback being an interesting mathematical phenomena that creates fractals in sound and and in visuals and things. And so even some of the background videos were based off of um, fractals that we created by taking a camera facing it into the computer and getting a visual feedback. So, and, and seeing just what came up in the, in the chaos that we recorded and then using some of that as like the background footage along with NASA stuff, so, <laughs> so yeah. There was also some video feedback in the last scene where you could see my arm when I had like 20 arms and stuff. Yeah, that was all the visual feedback. But you were asking about the overtone warp tunnel. That's, um, it's a uh, radial, uh, frequency, uh, <clears throat> basically FFT. Basically, you can you know you're, you get the this, this, the the audio information and you can see like on a graph the uh, the frequency. But this was like a, a radial one, so I took that and I added you know different effects to it and, and colors to it to to create that. So that's uh, 
yeah, specific audio reactive thing that I developed to travel you know, through the warp tunnel to get to these other destinations. Satya. What does it like to work with you? For you, your personal process of sharing your story, like this. It's, you know, like I didn't set out to, to do this necessarily. Um, but it feels good, you know. It's, uh, I don't always talk about, about it. I feel like I talk about it a lot, but Seema says, no, you never talk about it. About the kind of the darker things, right? You know, losing, uh, you know, having the loss. Um, so it feels good. It feels like a natural evolution, you know. And you know, I'm literally am doing the healing work and playing the music after telling the story. I'm doing it. I've been doing it, and I'm doing it even more on the stage here and with all your help. And hopefully, it's a group kind of healing experience. Yeah. All right. I think, yeah, I think that's great. Thank you all for being here. All right. Stick around. I'm happy to talk to you, everybody, and get, get some drinks if anybody wants to get some drinks with us. Uh,